Welcome. I am Mike Kanopin, the program director of the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, and you are currently part of a Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation program. Today's program is an Ask the Expert, part of our Ask the Expert series. And today's session is about myotonic dystrophy and intimacy. A bit about the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. We envision a world with treatments and a cure for myotonic dystrophy, and our mission is community care and a cure. We support and connect the myotonic dystrophy community. We provide resources and advocate for care. We accelerate research toward treatments and a cure. In addition to today's webinar presentation, you can find a number of resources at the MDF website. For example, we have toolkits and publications. These are resources for you, members of your family, and your care team. You can find those resources at myotonic.org slash toolkits dash publications. MDF offers a number of support programs, support groups, support group discussions, and uh, Facebook groups, and a number of other opportunities to connect and share and meet others. You can find all of those programs at myotonic.org slash find dash support. To find our support program events or any other event of the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, please visit our calendar of events online. You can find that at myotonic.org slash calendar slash month. This program is being recorded and will be added to our digital academy. There you can find a number of video recordings from past conferences, Ask the Expert sessions, Meet the DM Drug Developer, and so many other presentations from this year and past years. You can find all those presentations at myotonic.org slash digital dash academy. This is our first uh, Ask the Expert session for 2022. We have a number of other presentations most months this year on the third Friday of those months at noon Pacific. Next month, you'll be able to attend, for example, DM2 and managing pain. Other topics this year will include primary care, mental health, palliative care, and disability rights and future planning. You can register and submit questions in advance to all of these sessions at myotonic.org slash ask dash expert dash series. Remember, you will need to register for each session in the series. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers for today's session. Uh, the first is Cynthia Gagnon, PhD. Cynthia is an occupational therapist. She's a full professor at the School of Medicine and Health Sciences at Sherbrooke University, Quebec, Canada, and scientific director of the Groupe de Recherche Interdisciplinaire sur les Maladies Neuromusculaires, or GRIM. Her work aims at improving clinical care and accelerating clinical trial readiness in the most prevalent neuromuscular diseases throughout Canada. Dr. Gagnon's research includes natural history studies from an interdisciplinary perspective to be able to document the progression of DM and identify significant predictors and explanatory factors related to individuals' participation in daily activities and social roles, such as work. She also develops clinical practice guidelines for rehabilitation teams that work with individuals with neuromuscular diseases. Welcome, Cynthia. Our other speaker is Isabelle fizet Paulus, MPT. She is a candidate for master's degree at the Université de Sherbrooke, and she is a physical therapist in Gatineau, Quebec, Canada. She graduated from the McGill Physiotherapy Program offered by extension at Université de Québec à uh, Chicoutimi in 2018. She is currently doing her master's in research at the Université de Sherbrooke. Her research interests include pelvic floor rehabilitation, sexuality, physical therapy, urogynecological and anorectal dysfunction in neuromuscular diseases, specifically in myotonic dystrophy type 1. She is supervised in part by Dr. Gagnon. If today's program speaks to you, please consider showing your appreciation for MDF by a donation. Together, we will change the future of myotonic dystrophy. You can make a donation to MDF at myotonic.org slash donate. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, let's welcome Cynthia and Isabel, who will provide a presentation for us followed 
by a QA. and uh, I'm not seeing the presentation. Hi, everyone. While uh, Isabel is putting up the presentation, uh, I'm just so very glad to be here today. Uh, hopefully, sooner than later, we'll be able to uh, join uh, in person. But uh, we thought it was very important during the uh, Valentine month to talk about intimacy and more specifically about sexuality. And I just want to pay a tribute to the board chair and lifetime trustee of MDF, Jeremy Kelly, who is the one who actually uh, brought me uh, to this field of research and interest at the first time. I can re recall very vividly uh, after one of the FDF meeting, uh, asking me about, you know, Cynthia, I think you'll be the one that should be talking about sexuality in my ethnic dystrophy. And I told him, well, I don't know that much about this. He said, I'm sure you'll be able, so see you next year. And I said, yes. And so came back to Quebec, little, forget a little about it. And then two weeks later, I had a call from MDF saying, oh, we're very glad we heard that you're gonna speak next year about sexuality. I was like, oh my God, okay, I need to get going. And I had a chance first to have a wonderful team of occupational therapist student uh, that did a, a first clinical practice guideline uh, related to occupational therapy and neuromuscular disorder. And this will be available also in English very soon. And the second chance that I had was to have Isabel uh, as part of my student team that started to be very interested in sexuality as well, but from a um, uh, physical therapist perspective. And we're going on with two other uh, clinical practice guidelines, one in nursing that will probably be ready by next year, and one also with a sexologist uh, to understand other part of uh, sexuality. So it's really now becoming a, a larger field than I expected in my career. Uh, you can change Isabel. Okay, so that's okay, you've seen us. So what we'll be talking about, and I want to be very uh, mindful uh, because this is a topic that can bring uh, uneasiness, that you don't feel at ease with what will be uh, said. So just make sure that we, 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 oops, I think we're losing the presentation, sorry, technology. Uh, we want to make sure that at any time, if you feel at on unease by a word that we use or an expression or whatever, please put it in the chat and we'll address it for a next presentation because we really try to be mindful. So we will define important terminology related to sexual function, sexual activity, and intimate relationship because this is a very large topic and it means different things to different people. So we just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We'll also learn about two very exciting projects related to sexuality. And we'll also hopefully learn some strategy for pursuing an healthy and fulfilling sexual activities. The other thing that I want to put forward is that I please ask us questions. There is no bad, there is no wrong, there is no inadequate questions because we get better as uh, people affected by the disease, their partner are talking to us about what they are experiencing. And after that, we can start working on potential solutions but you have to ask, you have to tell us what is your uh, difficulties so that we can get better at doing it. Uh, next, yeah. Okay, so first, what is sexuality? So it is very an umbrella terms, which include biological sex, gender identities and roles, sexual orientation, eroticism, pleasure, intimacy, love life, reproduction. Of course, today we won't address all this because we will address it mostly from a uh, rehabilitation perspective, which is different than from a sexologist perspective or a, a doctor perspective, which could look at more at reproduction. Uh, a sexologist would maybe work more on gender identity, sexual orientation, or a psychologist. But for us, it's mostly related to other parts which are more related to rehab that you will hear about. And it, it could manifest in very different way because oftentimes people will only um, 
think that sexuality is actually the physical act of sexuality, but it's a lot more than that. It can manifest through your thought, your fantasy, your desire, your belief, your attitudes, your value, your behavior, your practices, your role, and your relationships. So it's a very large um, topic. Uh, sexuality is a fundamental need. As an occupational therapist, we are uh, it is part of what we call activity of daily living. So this is something that is part of human life. Uh, although it's not, usually it's not done on a daily basis, but still it's an activity of daily living. It is unique to everyone. You, you, you want different thing, you look for different thing, you're able to give different thing as one person. It will be experienced differently, and the importance in each person's lives will vary from times to time. And not only because of the disease, but only because of different uh, perspectives in your life, the timing, et cetera. It evolves and changes over the course of an individual life. There is several factors that will influence your own sexuality. Uh, you have religious and spiritual, value, you have biological, like your age, the presence of a disease, psychological and social, like anxiety, self-image. Uh, it can be also economic. It could be political and legal. Uh, it could be cultural and ethical, like social prejudice and openness to sexuality. And it's been evolved between decades. I mean, we only see right now uh, all the uh, positive talking about, uh, you know, uh, gender identities uh, that are more open than it used to be. So there is a lot of factor influencing your sexuality. Now, one thing that is very important to understand throughout the uh, presentation uh, is what is actually, you know, uh, when we talk about the sexual relationship, we talk first about excitement. So excitement is really what happened before uh, I would say the physical act, which is really about caressing, discussing, uh, all the, uh, what we call in, 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 in French, les préliminaires, which is put you into the mood for it, you know? And it can be very short when you have a lot of children and it can be very long when you have the beginning of a first romantic relationship. So it's varied throughout time. Uh, then you have the, the plateau, which is actually when you start to have an erection, you start to have lubrification, you start to uh, getting ready for the orgasm. And then after the orgasm, then there's the resolution, which means that you would have the blood flow will go back, your heart rate will go down, and usually you will feel more uh, at rest and peace. And for, um, for women and for, um, you can have multiple orgasm as well. This is a very simplified uh, model. There is a lot more complex model right now, but that's one of them. But the other thing that I want to point out is that this is a tiny part of sexual relationship, which means that uh, more and more in different, um, different platform, they're talking about that it's not an obligation to have an orgasm, to actually feel fulfilled by a sexual relationship. It can have other meaning, it can have other needs. So that's another thing that needs to be uh, put forward. Now, if we talk about sexual function and intimate relationships, just to differentiate the two. So sexual function is really the excitement, the plateau, so the organic phase and the resolution phase, so satisfaction, relaxation, absence of pain. Intimate relationship is more about romantic relationship, spousal relationship, and sexual relationship, which include a larger uh, body of type of relationship. And sexual activity, which will what we will be discussing a lot today, and sexual function, is caressing, masturbating, foreplay, and intercourse. In terms of myotonic dystrophy, there's a lot of uh, things that can interfere or change your relation to sexuality. So there is your sexual, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll come through all of this 
uh, throughout the presentation. So I won't put it into detail, but I will go uh, into uh, one by one. Okay, so how can sexual function, sexual activity can be affected by myocardial dystrophy? And that's some of the example that we found in the literature, because when we started to do this work, we did a review of literature because we are researchers, so we wanted to know who published on it. And there was not a lot of things published. So what we knew was that erectile dysfunction could be part of uh, DM1 symptoms, decreased vaginal lubrification, pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, and we'll go back to pelvic floor. Isabel will explain to you more a little bit about what are those muscles for. Lower sexual desire, pain during sexual activity. So a lot of the question you address in the chat about is that normal for myotonic dystrophy? Well, this is something that has been reported by patients uh, over the course of different studies. There's also muscle weakness that prevents you to take some uh, position, fatigue, loss of mobility, urinary and anorectal dysfunction, and cardiorespiratory impairment. And we'll go back through all of those. Isabel will explain to you and will give you strategies to overcome this. But what we came to the conclusion was that there were almost no research evidence. There was only a few articles. So the first step was uh, part of Isabel Master research program, which was to document the prevalence of urinary incontinence and other pelvic floor disorder, and you'll see what are those, in myotonic dystrophy. So she just completed a, um, a, a very nice study where she wanted to address those characteristics, but she also assessed the sexual function, and that's what we're going to be talking about. That was done on women only. Uh, we will be looking at men at another time, but we had to separate uh, sex because they're very different, of course. And we will explore the age of age phenotype. So having a late onset, an adult phenotype, a juvenile, will that make a difference? Muscle weakness, and also uh, for women, the number of deliveries of baby, because that's a very uh, important factor. So what we found was very interesting. So uh, we, uh, the study was performed in Quebec. It was done with a validated questionnaire and we included uh, 80 women that were 18 years old. So what we found was that 75% 75 pa 75 of patients were, uh, were sexually active and their age ranged from 23 to 70 years old. 60% of them experience urinary incontinence, that's a large number of people. 66% have abdominal pain, 56% have anal incontinence, 26% have fecal incontinence, 22% have pelvic pains, and 40% have constipation. It, and all of those can influence your intimacy and your sexual relationship, because if you have urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence, that can happen during sexual relationship and very interfere with that. For sexual dysfunction, there was 18% that described hypoactive sexual desire, so lower sexual desire, lower lubrification, and 43% at pain or discomfort during vaginal penetration. And this is very important because there is treatment and Isabel will come to that for that. There is potential treatment. 20% at this symptom at least half of the time. So now I let, the, the, uh, I let Isabel speak about what she's been uh, studying for so long because I cannot explain this graphic. So Isabel will go with the presentation. And at the end, we'll address the question that were on the um, that you sent, and any other question that we that you have. So, Isabel. Uh, yes. So we talked about pelvic floor disorder, uh, but what is really important is to understand pelvic floor muscle. So those muscles are located in the perineal region. Uh, so I don't know if you can see my mouse here. Uh, so it's a uh, form a hammock between a pubic bone and the tailbone. So as you can see in the male and here in the female, and there's the urethra, uh, the rectum, and the vaginal canal that pass through this muscle. So the, the pelvic floor muscle have urinary 
uh, anorectal and uh, sexual function. In the sexual function, those muscles uh, are implicated in clitoral um, arousal, erection, um, ejaculation, orgasm, uh, vaginal, vaginal tone for sensation. So as you can see, um, if you have problem with those muscles, it can affect your sexual function. We did a second project. Uh, it's, it was to develop a clinical practice guideline on role and intervention in physical therapy to promote sexuality in adults with neuromuscular disorder. Right now, the clinical practice guideline is not published, but there's an article uh, that has been submitted. As you may know, neuromuscular disorder are a family, a group of uh, disease that affect function of the muscle with alteration to the muscle itself or a, a peripheral nerve. There's more than 200 different diagnoses. Uh, it's all very unique and there's a wide range of signs and symptoms that can um, come with this disorder. One of the neuromuscular disorder um, is the myotonic dystrophy. Because of the impairment that comes with neuromuscular uh, disorder, it can affect uh, sexual activity by uh, directly with sexual function, but also with weakness, uh, breathing difficulty, uh, fatigue, all of those aspects can affect sexuality. There were three studies that were interesting for myotonic dystrophy. So as you can see, pain during sex was reported at 15.3% in the M1 and 33.3% in the M2. Impaired sexual function in general was also uh, really frequent, like you can see. Limited sexual positioning was unfortunately not reported for the M1. So we don't know if it's because it was not measured in this study or it was just not reported but we can see that 70.6% of people with DM2 uh, have problem with, uh, with positioning. Decreased sexual contact was also reported uh, by more than half of the person with DM1 and DM2. Another study found out that a sexual and intimacy problem was reported by 32% of people with DM1 and 44% of people with DM2. So we can see that it, um, it affects a lot of person. Another study, um, an older study, uh, found out that 70% of people with chronic disorder present problem with their sexuality and only 18% are able to overcome them independently. 60% of healthcare professionals believe that sexual difficulties should be discussed, but only 6% frequently engage the discussion. So we may ask uh, us, why are they not talking about this topic? Well, one of the reasons is that um, there's a lack of knowledge on this topic, and there's no really guideline to, um, to help them to discuss this topic. So this is why we created, um, we developed clinical practice guidelines. So as you can see, there's this one for occupational therapists. This one is published and uh, we are now uh, doing the one for physical therapists. Uh, right now they're only available in French, but like uh, Professor Gagnon told us, uh, it's gonna be published in English soon. So the objective were to document impairment in adults with neuromuscular disorder that can interfere with sexual activity and to propose physical therapy intervention for them. It was also to recommend approach to discuss sexuality and to highlight issues that require expertise in pelvic floor rehabilitation. So uh, now we're uh, going to the interesting part for you. Um, so we're going to present intervention and recommendation that we think uh, it would be useful or uh, maybe 
uh, something that you would be interesting, uh, interested um, by having myotonic dystrophy. However, all the recommendations and interventions are going to be general and um, it's not adapted to someone in particular. So you may need to consult with an healthcare professional to be sure. So first one is uh, physical activity. So we know that physical activity improves mental and physical well-being. And there's a lot of study that show that there's a direct impact on sexual function because it, uh, play, um, it, inc it increased the number of hormones and also um, play on the autonomic, autonom autonomic um, nervous system. So it uh, have a direct impact on sexual function. There's also indirect impact on sexual activity since when you're doing physical activity, you're improving your function in general, but also uh, improving your endurance and your strengthening your, uh, your muscle strength. In opposite, physical inactivity has been documented to increase the risk of developing sex sexual dysfunction like erectile uh, dysfunction. So it's really important that you stay active. And um, when we say active, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go to the gym uh, every day. It means that you need to increase the number of physical activity that you do every day. So you can do just walk more, uh, dancing, yoga, uh, gardening. Um, so all of these activities can help you prevent uh, sexual dysfunction. Muscle weakness um, is something that's really frequent with myotonic dystrophy. There's preliminary study that show um, that exercise has an effect on muscle strength. So uh, it's important that you have a muscle strengthening program, at least for maintaining your capacity. But when your muscle weakness affects uh, your sexual activity, it's, um, it's, it's uh, recommended that you use um, other uh, method to compensate for those weakness. So first um, recommendation that we're gonna do is to modify your sexual position and to be creative. So you can explore different area of your body and erogenic zone. Um, also sexual activity doesn't mean necessarily penetration. Um, we always think about intercourse, but there's a other uh, option that can be um, has satisfy uh, can satisfy you and be um, comfortable for you. So uh, you don't need always to go into intercourse because um, intercourse means more complex position. You can also practice position before trying it in a sexual context. Um, this weight will decrease the anxiety when it comes to doing the position. It will also, um, you'll be more prepared. You're gonna have less risk of hurting yourself and it will be less time consuming. Um, if something doesn't go um, as planned, it, go, it doesn't go well, you're trying a new position um, and it's not going well, you may lose your arousal, like we saw in the sexual response diagram. If, uh, if it takes too long, you may lose your erection, your lubrication, and, and it's going to be hard, frustrating to, um, to be aroused, uh, to have arousal again. So that's why you can practice position before trying it in a sexual context. Uh, you can also use furniture to uh, help you get into position. Uh, there's also sexual object that can be helpful. Um, weakness in the hand are frequent with myotonic dystrophy type 1. So there's some vibrator that are uh, hand-free and we're going to present some of them uh, later. Another thing that uh, frequent with myotonic dystrophy is fatigue. Um, so you need to determine when um, your energy level is at the highest 
and you can plan your sexual activity around it. Usually morning are the moment that you're gonna have the highest energy, um, but it can depend on uh, your, uh, your, uh, your body and how you, uh, what you have planned for the day. You can plan rest period before and after sexual activity. Also, um, penetration intercourse is going to be more energy uh, consuming. So sometimes you can uh, do maybe more foreplay um, than doing intercourse uh, when you're uh, more tired. So it's important that you uh, discuss this with your partner to tell them about your, um, your capacity, your, what you're feeling, what, um, what you expect from one another because it can be a lot um a lot of anxiety if you're you're trying to be at your best always for the other uh, another thing that i wanted to uh, tell you about is um the spontaneous aspect of sexual activity because i know if you're planning uh your sexual activity it's not really spontaneous um but spent the the fact that sexual activity has to be spontaneous is overrated it's it's what you see in the media in the um, in the, the movies and everything but it doesn't have to be like that because if it's planned well um you can have um you're, you're going to be more comfortable you're going to have more satisfaction on your sexuality sexual activity because you're going to be uh, prepare and you can have also a uh, increase of arousal just for anticipation so one recommendation that i would uh, suggest is that you take a time in the day um, could be like 30 minutes at the end of the day just to lie down on the bed and with your partner or alone so you just take this time to yourself and it doesn't have to lead to sexual activity but just to enjoy the company of uh, one another. So at least you'll have this time uh, planned for yourself or for uh, your relationship. And you can also uh, read erotic um, text to increase the arousal also. Um, contracture and reduced range of motion can sometimes happen uh, when you have um, uh, weakness and you lose mobility so stretching before sexual activity can be a good way to help position yourself and stay away from injury heat can also be applied to relax muscle hot shower could be useful but you have to be careful because with myotonic dystrophy um, there's a lot of person that suffers from low blood pressure so um, you have to be careful if you have uh, this aspect. There's also adapted position that uh, can help you if you have contracture. Uh, physical therapist can help you uh, develop a program for uh, stretching exercise. Erectile dysfunction is highly prevalent in DM1. Uh, we don't have study in DM2. So I don't know if it's uh, as high as DM1. Um, the first thing that you can control on your erectile function is all the lifestyle habits that have an impact on your erectile function. So obesity, physical inactivity, diet, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, all of those things are gonna have um, negative impact on your erectile function so you can have a control on that there's also the importance of pelvic floor muscle as we saw um, just a couple slides before so contraction of your pelvic floor muscle can actually um, help you uh, gain an erection because it's going to decrease the venous return from the cavernous tissue so uh, all the blood is going to go in your into your penis and it's not going to return so it's going to be hard and can help you with uh, penetration so with contraction it can help you doing the penetration but also uh, staying in erection during your uh, penetration 
the partner can also do contraction just um, around the penis to uh, increase the pressure and help the erection. Um, those aspects, uh, I would suggest that you see a physical therapist in uh, pelvic floor rehabilitation. They have, um, they can teach you how to do the pelvic floor um, exercise. They can um, show you other modalities. So I would suggest that you see someone um, in physical therapy. As we saw, uh, female lubrication was low in our study. Um, so it's important that lubrication is, um, is related to arousal and arousal is gonna begin with a top. So you're gonna think about sexual uh, activity. Uh, so you're gonna be arousal and after it's gonna come in your body. So you have to um, at least not neglect the psychological aspect of lubrication. Uh, you have to prepare your body with foreplay before doing intercourse if you have problem with lubrication. If it's still a problem, um, because with age, you're gonna have less lubrication also, there's three types of lubricants that um, we can suggest. So there's water-based, silicone, and oil-based. Water-based are the most uh, accessible. They're the most uh, cheap. So they can be used with condom and other sexual objects. However, since they're water-based, uh, they dry quickly and you need to reapply often. Uh, silicone lubricant uh, can be used under water. So if you're planning to have a sexual activity under uh, the shower, uh, you may use the silicone one. Uh, it can be used with condom and it offers a longer lubrication. However, they are more expensive, uh, they are more difficult to find than water-based, and they can be used with uh, silicone products. Um, so there's a lot of um, vibrators that are made of silicone, so you have to be careful, and uh, they are difficult to wash. Oil-based are the uh, really low cost. They offer uh, high hydration and moisturizing. Um, However, they can't be used with condom and they can stain, stain clothes and uh, the sheet. Uh, there's also study that um, suggests that pelvic floor muscle exercise, uh, vibratory uh, stimulation and transcutaneous electrical stimulation can help with uh, lubrication. Uh, so a physical therapist could uh, help you with all these modalities. Uh, pain is highly prevalent with DM1 and DM2. It's important to ident identify the cause of pain. Um, so it can be tension, myotonia, neurogenic pain. It could be dryness, uh, low lubrication. Uh, so your physician and physical therapist can help you uh, just to ident identify the cause of pain. Uh, if you have chronic pain, um, you can schedule your sexual activity at time when the pain is less intense and synchronize with medication level of fatigue and stress. Uh, because level of fatigue and stress is gonna negatively impact your, um, your pain. Relaxation and rest after and before sex can actually uh, help you reduce the pain. And there's some modification in the position that can also um, help you when you have pain. Uh, so I'm thinking about um, vaginal penetration, so deep penetration. Some women um, have pain during uh, those, um, those positions. Uh, if you have back pain, if you have um, overload on your articulation, so there's a different way that you can explore in the position to uh, reduce the pain. Uh, as Dr. Gagnon said, um, physical therapy has been proven to help with pelvic pain. So for vaginal pain during penetration, uh, they can help you with exercise, uh, stretch, um, 
biofeedback, dilatator, and all of those things. So if you have this problem, you can consult with the physical therapist. Another aspect that we saw that was prevalent is incontinence. Um, as erectile dysfunction, um, you can have an impact on the lifestyle habit that you have. So if you lose some weight, you increase your physical activity, uh, you stop uh, smoking, you decrease caffeine consumption, it can help you with your symptom. Um, another important aspect that I want to tell you, and I think it's, it's really uh, something that people don't know, is when you have urinary incontinence, don't try to uh, cut on your water intake. Because if you don't um, take enough water, take enough liquid, it's just going to increase your incontinence. Because the, um, if your bladder is full of uh, concentrate urine, so you just have a little bit of urine, but it's really concentrate because you don't have um, a lot of water intake, it's just going to provoke the bladder to, um, to want to urinate and you're going to have leaks. So it's important that you stay hydrated. A pelvic floor muscle exercise can also help you to prevent the incontinence uh, when you're coughing or um, when you're doing an effort. So to prevent the leak, um, those exercises can help you um, increase the strength on your pelvic floor muscle. If you have urinary incontinence during um, your sexual activity, uh, you can empty the bladder before uh, your activity and put a protection on the bed uh, to decrease anxiety associated with those leaks. Another thing that you can do um, is to change the position. If you have urgency to go to the toilet when you're doing penetration, it happens to a lot of women. Um, they suggest that you uh, lie on your back and you put some pillow underneath your um, pelvis, uh, pelvic and lower back. So your bladder is going to be um, in uh, anti gravity. So it can help a little bit uh, to reduce the urgency. As for the other, physical therapy can help you for the pelvic floor muscle exercise. Uh, respiratory and cardiac implication are also something that can happen with myotonic dystrophy. So I'm thinking about difficulty uh, breathing and um, so when you're doing uh, sexual activity, you're going to need uh, uh, a lot of breathing, a lot of endurance. So it's important that you avoid eating one hour, one, one hour before your sexual activity, that you don't uh, consume alcohol three hours before your sexual activity, and uh, avoid hot, humid, or cold environment. Plan your sexual activity when you're well rested, so you're going to breathe easier. And uh, there's some strategy that can help with uh, dyspnea. Uh, dyspnea is when uh, you have difficulty breathing. Uh, so there are some posture that are better. Uh, purse lip breathing, diaphragmatic breathing also can help you. Uh, positioning, we talked a little bit uh, before. Like I said, uh, not all sexual activity involve penetration, intercourse. Um, so try to change a little bit of that. Um, if you have difficulty, it, you don't need to do every time intercourse. It's important to respect capacity of both, part, both partners. It's important to discuss with your partner what you are capable of, of doing, what's your interest. Uh, what you want, what you um, what you can do by yourself also. Um, so it's important that you have a good discussion with them. You have to take into consideration and uh, maintaining the position, the movement in the position, and transferring uh, between positions. All of those aspects are really important. Uh, there are some 
adaptation equipment that can help you uh, when in your position. So pillow, bed helper, uh, just um, to help uh, get into bed, um, bean bag, electric bed. Uh, you can also practice a uh, position before a uh, sexual context, like I said. So I'm going to go fast um, here on the position. So I just want to um, propose some position. So on the back, it's um, something that the woman or the man can um, be. It's less effort. It gives more support. You can do a lot of activity uh, with that. You can also um, put pillow underneath your uh, pelvic or lower back or knee. It's going to change your um, pelvic angle. So when you have lower back pain, uh, it can help. And it can help also uh, changing the, uh, the angle of the penetration. Uh, for the women, um, it, if she has difficulty with flexibility and opening her leg for penetration what she can do is she can lie on the edge of the bed and um, just release one leg like you can see yes here release one leg outside the bed so this way it's gonna um, uh, let the other person doing the, um, the penetration here Another way is that she can um, bend her leg. She can um, put uh, on the shoulder of her partner if she has enough flexibility, but she could also um, just put them on the chest to um, facilitate um, penetration. Um, the second position is on the side, face to face. I don't have a picture um, for this, but uh, you can do a lot of activity. Uh, it's more passive position. Both partner can participate. And it's an interesting position if both have limitations. And one thing I want to tell is um, it's interesting if you have a pain with deep penetration, because in this position, you're not going to have a full penetration. So it can be useful for those women. A third position is on the side. Uh, you can be um, uh, on the spoon position here or perpendicular position. Uh, as for the other, it can be the woman or the man that takes this position. So here it can be a woman or a man here too. So it depends on the activity that you're going to do. Um, you can also put pillow uh, here just to stabilize, but also here. And for, um, for the person that's here, she can also put a pillow uh, under, um, uh, in between her knee just to open, um, uh, allow access to, uh, to, to uh, penetration and uh, decrease the the stress on the hip. Okay. Uh, fourth position is sitting. So you can sit on a, a regular chair or if person is in wheelchair, she can, uh, they can also uh, be in this position, you can sit on the, um, on the bed also. It's a passive position for the person seated and it decreases the number of transfer if the person is in wheelchair. Um, of course, if the man is sitting, it's easier. There's more activity possible. Uh, the partner can be face to face uh, on, um, on the back like this or on the side. If the woman is sitting, uh, it's a little bit harder. She can move the bottom a little bit forward on the chair for penetration or oral sex, but this will decrease the support. Um, just looking if I had anything. Yes, uh, if you're in a wheelchair, you can um, take off the armrest and the side support. Uh, it can allow to have more um, position possible. However, it's going to decrease the trunk support. 
uh, so it depends on what you want and for the person on top uh, the, this person can uh, lean into a bed or um, furniture just to stabilize uh, uh, herself or himself the fifth position and it's the, the last position is on the abdomen it's not um, our favorite one because um, it, you have to avoid this if you have difficulty breathing it's going to be harder and if you have difficulty to roll over onto your back or if you have civil, uh, severe weakness of the upper limb. However, um, it's great for um, deep penetration if you want. Um, you can do masturbation also like this and uh, you can do, um, you can be on the middle of the bend, but it also uh, include the doggy style position. Uh, last intervention that I want to talk really quick uh, is the sex object. With myotonic dystrophy, um, there's a lot of hand weakness and uh, for masturbation, it involves a lot of um, hand, uh, hand movement. For, uh, so for women, as you can see, there's a lot of things that um, exist. The, um, I didn't put the reference because um, we don't want to support any company or something. Um, it's just uh, to show you some example, but all of those things here, um, you don't have to hold the, the, the object. So it can decrease a little bit um, the energy that you have to put. So you just have to uh, uh, place the, the sexual object and you don't have to hold it. Uh, for those one, the magic one and the finger vibrator, massage glove, uh, it involves less movement, but you have to uh, stay in position and um, uh, just to hold the object in place. For the magic one, uh, what I thought it was interesting is there's a magic mount that exists. So you can put the magic one in the, um, the little pillow. So it stays there and you can just lie down on the pillow to have a simulation. Also, uh, there's a handy harness that exists. So you can just put the harness on your hand and um, have a dildo on your hand so you can do a simulation a vaginal simulation and uh, so you don't have to grab the, the object so I, I thought it was interesting and for men um, they're similar sexual object uh, so uh, the penis simulator male masturbator those ones you have to hold but they're doing a suction um, vibrating movement. So you don't actually have to do repeat movement. You just have to hold the, um, the object in place. Um, vibrator, penny spring, and WeVibe is actually a device that you can just put and you don't uh, need to use your hand. So they are called uh, hand-free. And um, the kneeling mount, like we saw for the, uh, the women, you can put the penis simulator in um, the kneeling mount and uh, just do like a picture, uh, like it shows in the picture. So it um, allows you to have a, a, a bigger grip. So it don't need a lot of uh, dexterity of your finger. And you can also be on your back. You don't need to be um, on your knee to do a, uh, uh, like the penetration. There's also a sex object for a couple for uh, penetration. So as we suggest, um, there's some pillow that exists that can help you um, change the angle of the, the pelvic. So it, um, when you have pain with deep penetration, it can, um, it can be useful. There's also the owner uh, that exists that's uh, going to reduce the um, uh, deep penetration. 
Uh, penny sleeve is also something that can put um, on the man penis when he has a erectile dysfunction. So it allows to have um, um, to have um, a penetration. You don't need to be in erection to have penetration. So you can just put it on your penis to have a penetration with your partner. There's also a strap-on here. You, you have another in boxer, so you can put a dildo to have a penetration. There's also a sling and strap, as you can see here, and uh, that's interesting for just stabilizing the trunk. If you have difficulty and you want to try uh, those type of um, position, and if you have a difficulty also with flexibility, it can be useful also. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, sexuality and intimacy are part of a fundamental need. Um, neuromuscular disease can affect your sexuality because it can affect your sexual function, but also other function that's gonna limit um, your sexual activity. There's many ways to adapt your sexual life uh, with myotonic dystrophy. We show some intervention, but there's probably other way that you know better than us. And um, so it's just to be creative and to think outside the box a little bit. Um, future st studies should focus on developing intervention for improving sexual function. Um, so we think uh, it would be interesting at least to, to see if um, pelvic floor muscle exercise could be really uh, useful for people with myotonic dystrophy, for example. So we would like to create intervention uh, specif specifically for uh, people living with neuromuscular uh, disorder. So uh, thank you for assisting to the webinar. Is there any question? Isabel and Cynthia, thank you so much for that extraordinary presentation. It has been so thorough and informative. Uh, I would now like to take some time to address some of the questions from our live attendees, and then we will go to the questions that were submitted in advance. So at this time, I see we do have a number of questions and we'll get to them in order. Uh, one question uh, is related to muscle strengthening. So the question is that you recommend muscle strengthening exercises, but my doctors have said you have to be careful not to break down muscle because it may not heal or strengthen again. And they say all you can do is maintain what you have. Could you please address this question about muscle strength? Yeah, sure. I can I can add on and Isabel can continue. So there is a, a general fear usually of strengthening muscle based on other neuromuscular disease. But what we've been showing in studies, we've done it, we've done it with men with myotonic dystrophy. There is evidence that it's been published, and now we're doing it with women, is that you can actually do strengthening exercise. Uh, and your muscle will grow and it will not be harmful to your muscle. That doesn't mean that you will regain everything that your disease has taken, but at least you can maintain or increase a little bit your uh, your muscle strength. So I would say that you need to consult at least with, you, with a neuromuscular specialist, a physiotherapist or a neurologist that is specialized in myotonic dystrophy that will be able to go to the newest evidence about uh, strength training. So of course, you don't want to overdo it as well, but uh, usually it's it's now thought as safe for uh, muscle strengthening. Thank you very much. Another question is, how do your study findings compare to others with neurological conditions? Hmm, good question. Isabel, do you want to start or I start? <laughs> Uh, well, in general, in neuromuscular um, disease disorder, uh, there's not a lot of on uh, sexual function. 
So in my attending dystrophy, we showed you uh, what we found there. I don't think there's other study that measure really uh, sexual function. So our study was really uh, specifically for women um, because eventually we want to see if um, pelvic floor muscle exercise would be helpful for incontinence or other pelvic floor disorder. Um, but with other neuromuscular disease, there's not also a lot of done on intervention and there's not a lot of study that measure uh, sexual function um, that I think of. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gagnon? Yeah, when we did the review of literature, we, we look across the board because on neuromuscular disorder, there was not a lot. We went to multiple sclerosis. We went to ataxic disorder. So it's very different. Like in ataxia, you have specificity. That means that your hips is going to adopt like this. So it will be very difficult to open your hips, let's say, for a woman. So it's it's kind of very different. But across the board, the three things that are things are true for, I, I mean, any neurological disorder, and depending even in people without disability, I think that there's three things is that sometimes, I mean, I have low back pain. So at one point or another, I had to change my position because I had low back pain. So it was not possible. Now it's better, but it's still, you know, I still be careful. So I think that talking to your doctor, talking to your doctor, sadly what we said is that only 6% of your uh, healthcare professional will openly talk to you about it. But that doesn't mean that they are not willing to help you it just means that everybody's shy around that topic for a lot of people you know it's not easy to talk about it so i think that one thing is to try to get uh to just, when you're training uh people to get more comfortable the second thing is that as isabel put it and i think it, it was very important discussion discussion about we're going to try something new and there's no expectation about orgasm there's been an overrated of orgasm. That's all we see in movie. That's all we see in all this. It's every time. There's no movie where we say, oh, shit, we didn't have orgasm today. We'll try tomorrow. There's not a lot of positive image of really what it is. You know, I mean, and, I mean, I would ask the audience, everybody had issue with sexuality, but it's often resolved by talking, by trying, by being playful, by just saying, okay, we're just gonna try it. And if it doesn't work, we'll just go watch a movie. And that's it, you know? So that's the, the second thing. And the third thing is really uh, to be mindful of your own symptom and respect it and not try to be, as she said, the better, the better of yourself every time. And I think that that is across the board, the most important message. And I don't know if Isabel has something else, but I think that that's the three key message to take on. No, I think you, you did it uh, really well. <laughs> Another question we have is if you could summarize how breath work, physical exercise, including pelvic floor exercises, and some of the other topics you've mentioned help with sexual or intimate functioning. If you could just offer a summary of how those things connect. Uh, Isabel, do you want to start? Yes. Um, so as I understand the question is uh, more about how the pelvic floor muscle exercise can help you with all of those symptoms. Um, well, pelvic floor muscle, as I said, are really important uh, in sexual function. And uh, for example, in incontinence, so um, there's some uh, person, uh, mostly women, that have incontinence during uh, during uh, sex. So it can be uh, just during or during uh, orgasm. Uh, so, oops, I think that Isabella is. Uh, are you still on, Michael? Because I think Isabella has lost connection. Yes, I'm. I'm still here. I see that as well. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll... while we wait for, yeah. I can oh, and then she can come back when the connection is better. But so pelvic floor rehabilitation is kind of a new concept. I mean, it's been there around, but it's not as well known. 
but by increasing the strength of that pelvic floor muscle, you can prevent uh, incontinence in some to some aspect. It's like when you give birth to a baby, more and more your physician will now uh, tell you that you know you, you need to go to a physiotherapist with a pelvic floor training so that you can get those muscles back into action. And they're kind of weird muscle. They're kind of intimate. And you're not, I mean, you you under, you need those uh, physiotherapists to help you understand where to contract, when to contract. And when you do it enough, then it's 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 really helpful. And even during the um, during the um, I would say the uh, the penetration, there's a lot of tension around those muscles. And as those tension grows, pain grows. And when pain grows, anxiety grows. And when anxiety grows, stress you know so it's a it's a it's a it's a very bad cycle that got into it so that's where you need to really uh have that specialized services uh that could really be helpful and there's more and more evidence about how those pelvic floor training uh can be helpful but you need to have a uh, physiotherapist that has that specialized training uh, to do so but they're quite frequent now they're not like they're not like only in big centers. I mean, I have it in Stagne, so uh, you probably have it uh, in the US. Thank you, Cynthia. Another question, are Kegels the most effective exercise for strengthening pelvic floor muscles? So the Kegel is one. I'm not the specialist there. Isabel should have been here, but oh, Isabel, this next question is, is the Kegel exercise the best for reinforcing the pelvic floor? And uh, I was well, I'm not so sure I can answer that one. <laughs> uh, well, first, I'm sorry for um, quit, uh, just uh, quitting the reunion. Uh, I think it was too much for my computer. Uh, actually, Kegel is uh, Dr. Kegel that uh, first discovered pelvic floor muscle exercise. So Kegel muscle, uh, Kegel exercise or pelvic floor muscle exercise. So uh, that's the same thing. Um, so it's the same concept, but, but there's a different type of um, exercise that you can do. Um, you can change the modality of these exercise. So physical, ther uh, physical therapists can help you uh, to have a, an adapted um, exercise program. Thank you very much. Another question. Uh, going back to the discussion of orgasm, is what about the relief of body issues relevant to the orgasm? Or put another way, other than pleasure, what is the impact or health implications of orgasm, uh, including its relevance to stress and tension relief? Um, Isabel, and I go. Um, well, with orgasm, um, there's, um, like you said, there's a release of tension uh, that has been documented. First, the pelvic floor muscle contract during uh, orgasm, but there's a release of tension of all of your body, and uh, there's a release of hormone and um, also um, what's the type of hormone that's released uh, when you have pleasure? Uh, uh, no, dopamine, no. Oh, oh, the, the hormone of pleasure. So. The hormone of pleasure. So, you know that uh, too. you can see. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's, um, there's all of those things that happens. And um, just by having physical uh, activity, because sexual activity is a physical activity, uh, there's... Um, blood flow that increase and uh, so it's always good for all your body to um, just do a little bit of cleanup uh, every, uh, everywhere and so with orgasm uh, you have all of the intense um, feeling intense sensation so of course all the uh, blood flow that uh, happens during uh, your activity is um, beneficial for your body. And the other thing that I would put forward is that uh, it may, because, and correct me, Isabel, but it may that during penetration, you won't have an orgasm, but then you can have an orgasm another way. And just being 
uh, mindful with your partner that I'm not able to achieve orgasm during penetration and that's okay, but I enjoy being with you and having you inside me, but I will have an orgasm another way and that can involve sexual toys like in Charcot Marie 2 disease. There is a lot, uh, women experience a lot less sensation. So if you, up to a point in the disease, if you don't use a, uh, a sex object to vi that provide vibration, it's impossible for that woman to have an orgasm. I mean, even if she has the best partner in life, it's not enough because the sensation are decreasing because of the disease. So once you explain that to your, your partner, that this is not because there's no issue of desire or capacity or anything, it's just a body function. So then they can learn to play about, okay, it's about time. And it's also difficult for the partner because it's aroused, but that's not exactly the time. And it's not in sync, but by talking, by changing method, by saying, okay, you, I can have a penetration, I won't have an orgasm, but that's okay, you can give me an orgasm a different way, you know? So it's all about changing and adapting. And of course we would love it that it will all be, everyone will do it the same, but it's not, that's not what sexuality is about. And it's also something that is also part of his beauty. Thank you both so much. Another question, we have very, very many questions. Uh, <laughs> if someone could talk about uh, more of the symptoms of sexual dysfunction, so I think sexual dysfunction has been mentioned a few times. If you could just describe what that can mean. Yeah, Isabel. Uh, I think what you're referring to is our study uh, that said I think 18% 18, 18 of women had sexual dysfunction. Uh, so this is measured with a questionnaire that was measuring, uh, measuring arousal um, excitement because they have a different, um, it's not the same thing. Um, orgasm, uh, presence of not of pain and lubrication. So it was measuring all of those aspects. And if you had um, a lot of the problem with all of these um, area, you were um, described as having uh, sexual dysfunction. So that's how they measure um, these aspects in women. But sexual dysfunction is really general term, but it could mean uh, that you have pain during penetration, you have erectile dysfunction, there's even um, ejaculation, uh, premature ejaculation that could be um, in the sexual dysfunction, um, low lubrication, uh, low desire. So all of those things um, would class as sexual dysfunction. But in, in our study, it was really measured with a questionnaire. And um, if you had enough symptoms, you would, um, you would enter the category of having sexual dysfunction. And just Michael to add, in, in terms of low desire, we didn't address it a lot, we did a little, but it's really part of another specialty, which is uh, sexologists. And I will be very careful about sexologists because it depends on provinces, on country, but in our provinces in Quebec, sexologists are part of the rehabilitation, rehabilitation team, if you're lucky. But there is sexologists that will be working with uh, um, uh, um, a spinal cord injury patient, that will work with neuromuscular disease patients, that will work with multiple sclerosis patients, that will help them to understand either their lack of desire, their lower uh, you know, uh, ability to, uh, to get aroused or to get orgasm. So there's really things that need, and as Isabel said, there's a lot of things that is um, that needs to be done in order to lubricate, in order to enjoy sexuality. And that is not, that's something that needs to be discussed and that could be worked on. You know, it doesn't mean that it's going to work, but it's certainly going to help to understand why are you, uh, you used to have, uh, you know, um, regular desire and now you're, you, this is decreased and there can be many, many reasons for that. But that's another part of 
in one thing is sexuality is an interdisciplinary field. There's not one specialist that can actually answer all questions. And sometimes uh, and sometimes it's not like an extensive therapy that you need. Sometimes it's a little trigger, change the way you're thinking, uh, change the way you're interacting with your partner. So I think there's really things that needs to, uh, you know, that you can um, work on. But we're not addressing it per se because that's none of our uh, really specialty to increase arousal. We can give a, a few tricks, but that's it. And also uh, an important uh, thing to remember is with medication also, uh, some of them like for depression and um, all of these aspects, uh, it can decrease arousal and uh, your physician can, to, uh, can tell you. So sometimes um, it can change the type of medication, uh, sometimes it's not possible, but at least uh, you'll know that it, it can influence your uh, arousal, your interest, um, and you can to, uh, discuss it with your partner so even, you'll understand yeah so true and even the birth pill control i mean there is birth pill control that are decreasing desire you know which is kind of making it more difficult to get children as well but i mean there's a lot of you know things that can influence so uh, you need to consult could you discuss any uh, particular issues uh, that have come up so far that may relate to same-sex sex. Most of the examples in discussion that cited sex referred to opposite-sex sex, and we just had some questions about what, if any, specifics you could share about uh, same-sex couples, or if everything you've shared kind of applies to them as well. Uh, first, I think that uh, maybe you didn't see in the picture, but we've been trying to be cautious with our graphic designer to put two people that you cannot identify as a man or as a woman. Uh, we're still working on being as inclusive as possible. And on the sex object, um, there's all of those things can apply to both because the harness can be, can be uh, worn by a woman and a dildo to uh, penetrate her female partner. So, uh, they're, they're, so we are trying to be as inclusive and in the final guidelines, we made it review by people with uh, different uh, sexual orientation. Uh, so to make sure that we are as inclusive. The other thing we didn't go through, but is also part of sexuality is what we call creative sexuality. So there is, um, um, now I'm trying to figure out the name, but um, you know, um, uh, S uh, Sadomasochist, c'est quoi en, en anglais? Uh, like uh, using whip or using yeah. bonding or using, and even there, I mean, I had occupational therapists uh, that have worked with clients that had very special need, very special view of their sexuality. And he was uh, working very creatively to be able to help that uh, person to uh, enjoy her sexuality the way that she envisioned it. So it's really, uh, I think that all of them, we've, we've tried to be as inclusive as possible in the, uh, in, the, um, in the layout of the guideline and hopefully in the presentation, but thank you for addressing that. I think it's, it's very important. And uh, so we'll, and We'll try to make sure that, well, the guide will be, is reviewed by people of different uh, sexual orientations so that we will be able to make sure that it, uh, it's inclusive. I just want to add that, um, yes, all those um, sexual positions can be um, with um, uh, same sex or um, all, everything is possible and we try to include that in our uh, clinical practice guideline. Um, in my example and everything, I may have used more um, uh, same uh, opposite sex relation uh, because that's what I know and I'm used to, but I try to change that. Um, the other thing that I want uh, to discuss is just uh, anal penetration, um, which could be uh, opposite sex, but also uh, same sex. Uh, it's also possible with um, all the sexual object and um, I'm thinking about some someone with erectile dysfunction it could be um, it could be used in the um, 
the person that received the anal penetration can also do a um, contraction of, uh, his, uh, of his, his pelvic floor muscle to help erection. But with anal penetration, um, since there's a lot of pressure, it can be, you're gonna need to have um, a, a bigger erection. Uh, if I can say it just, um, it, if it's just because the, the vagina is uh, much more um, open, it's, you don't need to have as much pressure. Uh, so it's easier if you don't have a full erection, but with anal penetration, you need full erection. Um, if you don't have it, it's, gonna, it's not going to work. So if you can gain full erection during an out penetration, the person can do contraction, um, but uh, you have to have full erection before uh, going into uh, this phase. Was that clear? I'm not sure. <laughs> it was clear, I think. <laughs> Yes, Isabel, actually, we had a follow up question about anal sex and whether it impacts um, anal incontinence or causes weakness in muscles. There's preliminary study, unfortunately, that says that that could cause incontinence. However, if it's part of your practice and everything and you know the consequence, um, it's okay to do that. Uh, I mean, there, but yes, there's a little bit of study that show that if you practice regularly, so not just one time um, every six months or something, but regularly, it could increase the risk of developing anal incontinence, but there's not a lot of study that, um, that was published on this subject. But Isabel, correct me on the pelvic floor. If someone is uh, is uh, practicing anal sex and want to prevent anal incontinence, uh, consulting a physiotherapist in perineural rehabilitation could help to prevent as long as possible by keeping his muscle fit. Correct? Yes. Um, of course, you can do uh, the person can do a pelvic floor muscle exercise to uh, keep it tight, keep it strong, um, and um, of course, there's more incontinence if there's um, non-consensual sex also, because you're not going to be prepared. But for two person that um, wants to have anal sex, the, the anus is going to be prepared and uh, there's less risk to um, have incontinence. Um, however, with frequency, it can increase a little bit of um, incontinence. But um, what's what we didn't tell you is that incontinence is more prevalent in um, women because women have um, a little bit weaker pelvic floor and because of um, when we give birth and everything, um, the, the, the pelvic floor muscle goes to a big trauma and can lose the, um, the structure and can increase the risk of developing incontinence. For men and men, anal sex, I would say it's less um, risky to have incontinence, but um, there's not study that showed it. But I would think that it would be um, uh, there would be less risk of developing um, uh, incontinence for men. We do have a number of questions remaining, so I will uh, invite our speakers to stay on as long as they are able. Um, our next question is related to depression. Uh, does depression compound the issues around DM1 regarding sex? Uh, the prevalence of uh, depression in DM1 is, um, is kind of conflictual. Uh, because it depends on the questionnaire that you are using. The, uh, so some of uh, what we've seen is that on the questionnaire, some people present with depressive symptoms, but in practice, not a lot of them are using a medication or are under psychological treatment. So it's hard to see if there's a, if there's a, 
everything is important, but I mean, is that a severe depression or not a severe depression? Because you can have depressive symptoms as part of your condition, as part of the progression of the condition for many reasons or for other reasons that, you know, something happened in your life. But of course, depression can be something that influences sexuality in terms of arousal, desire, energy, uh, Isabel pointed out medication as well. So I think the best thing is to discuss with your uh, doctor about uh, if you're having depressive symptoms or depression, uh, to try to uh, uh, get, yes, medication, but also maybe a psychotherapy or to address those issues related to sexuality as well. And how can you, um, um, you know, uh, overcome maybe those symptoms uh, for, uh, during sexual um, activities? Is that clear? I hope so. I believe it was. We had another question about, I'm skipping down here to uh, muscle involvement in oral sex. So could you discuss briefly mouth, tongue, and other you know muscle involvements for oral sex? Yeah, and that's a brilliant question because I don't think we address it a lot in the clinical practice, Gala. I think we need to do that. I think we do a little. I think it's I think it just gave us an idea to study that, but no, I'd never thought about the, the muscle in, involvement, and that's true with myotonic dystrophy. You have a, a lot of um, weakness on the, the facial. Uh, no, I never think, thought about that, so I can't answer, but uh, that's a good question, and we're going to keep it in mind. Yeah. One thing that I would say is that uh, being in the field for longer a little bit, I think that uh, giving a, an orgasm through all our sex will depend on the time it takes for your partner to come. And yes, it can become painful on, on the tongue, on the mouth, it can be tiring, even if you don't have decreased strength. So I think that, again, you can be playful by using toys and using your mouth and using toys and using your mouth, and that may help to actually relieve a little bit of the stress of having to, because there's no damage that's going to be done to your muscle because of performing oral sex uh, to your partner. Uh, in terms of um, if you are um, if you you are masturbating orally, your part your 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 male partner, again it's difficult to keep the pressure to keep the. But then you can use those little fun uh, ring that vibrate that give a lot of vibration. So then you don't have to put enough a lot of pressure. I don't know if you recall it, that ring that you put on the penis of your partner, they're vibrating all sorts of ways. And then you can actually uh, just enjoy having your uh, male partner in your mouth and just, you know, enjoying uh, contact and caress, but you don't have to provide all the, uh, the stimulation. So I think that again, it's a, it's a, a way and one thing we did a lot is, and it, I mean, that's been a wonderful experience with my students. We went to a lot of sex shop. And if you go to those sex shop and you, you have to choose your sex shop, they're not all equal, try many, but there is very, very good people there that are very experienced and are experienced with people with disabilities that if you explain the problem, if you explain what you have, uh, they will, they know their product, they want you to come back, they don't sell things just to sell them, and some of them are tremendous. And there's a website that is called Come As You Are, and we can send the link to Michael to put it at the last, and it's a wonderful website for uh, sex toys that explain to you what is, uh, what is the advantage, the disadvantage, like for Charcot Mary to women, we had to try a lot of vibrator because it had to be a very strong vibrator, which most women would feel painful or not fun. But for that particular woman, this was actually what she needed to get arousal and excitement and be able to reach orgasm with her partner. So going back, I diverted the question. But I think that, again, uh, those people are not used to their full potential, I think, because they, uh, I've met wonderful uh, people in the, in the sex shop that uh, give a, a lot of very good uh, um, advice. And you can also uh, shop online and there's a chat box, uh, some uh, of the, uh, the shop that have uh, 
chat box so you can ask your question if you're too shy to go to a sex shop also. And again, your healthcare provider, if it's a sexologist, an occupational therapist, that is, of course, they're not all uh, trained to do that, but uh, with the clinical care practice guideline, we're trying to get OTs and PT uh, more educated about sex toys so that they can give recommendation to their patients. At this time, I want to thank both of our presenters uh, and in a moment, I'll, I'll invite uh, Cynthia and Isabel to both share some final thoughts, but we are 90 minutes into this fantastic presentation. We still do have a lot of questions. So if I can impose on you, Cynthia and Isabel, I'd like to send them to you in writing and maybe we can get some written responses and provide that feedback as a resource as well. Thank you both. Um, but I, I do not want to keep you here all day. I think we could, I really think that we could. Um, in addition to the questions we've received today, we have received countless words of thanks to both of you for opening up this really important, very human conversation that is so, so critical to every member of our community. We have heard from parents today. We have heard from individuals living with DM of all ages, of DM1 and DM2. Everyone sending tons and tons of thanks to both Cynthia and Isabel, and you have the gratitude of the entire Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation as well. Um, I would like to now turn to you both for any parting thoughts you have for our community, final words, resources, uh, anything else you'd like to share with us today. Um, well, thank you uh, to be, um, um, I, I think it, it, it's a wonderful experience that we have started a few years ago. It's a wonderful journey. It, brought me as much as I gave, I think. And it's a very, uh, so, so interesting project. Uh, so thank you to have asked that question and to have invited us over and over to talk about sexuality. Uh, the other thing that I know in the, in the expert or the chat, there is a lot of question about meeting people uh, when you have a disability. And I think that that's something very interesting. And I will address it with my student in sexology so that, that when she write about her clinical care guideline, it'll take a little bit of time but to address that. But there is a specialized website, a dating website for people with disability. We have a very good one in Quebec. I cannot tell you in the United States, but I'm sure with a little search you can find where there is um, uh, those type of, uh, you know, which probably are more trustful than other uh, dating sites, uh, you know, and that are dedicated with people with uh, disability. Isabel? Well, uh, thank you for attending this meeting and um, I really hope that there's something in our presenta presentation that um, maybe it's going to help you or uh, helps you think about something that you could do to to help you um, and I'm hoping also that it's not the end of our research that we're going to keep uh, researching about myotonic dystrophy and sexual uh, function so we can uh, give other recommendation other intervention and uh, maybe do another webinar maybe in a couple of years uh, just to <laughs> just to give you uh, what's up to date, what we found out about myotonic dystrophy. So thank you. Isabel Fizet polus is a uh, uh, master's in physical therapy at Sherbrooke and Cynthia Gagnon PhD is an occupational therapist PhD. We are grateful to both of you, so, so grateful to both of you for this extraordinary presentation and discussion today which has been recorded and will be available on myotonic.org. We will also see if we can get the, the excellent presentation and slides from our speakers to share there as well, so that uh, attendees today and many, many others can enjoy that information and use it for healthy, safe, creative, adventurous uh, intimacy in their lives. Thank you all so much for attending and goodbye. <laughs>